thinking about conflict and conflict theory. All right. First thing that you need to know is conflict is normal. It's healthy. It's a positive force in everyone's life. Now that might seem a little like an odd statement, right? We know that conflict's normal, but we've kind of grown up in this sense that if we have conflict, it's not really healthy, right? Um, especially like with loved ones, significant others, if you have a conflict, sometimes we try to ignore it, sweep it under the rug, whatever. We shouldn't, we should embrace it. It's a healthy thing, right? We're different people with different needs, different interests. They're gonna collide at times and that's perfectly fine. That's healthy because from that, we can turn our conflict into a positive force, all right? So conflict has such a negative connotation, right? So when we're mediating or arbitrating or even negotiating, our parties, are in conflict. Now, conflict and crisis are two separate things. And what happens a lot is people use conflict to mean crisis, right? Um, it's not. Right? I mean, it can be. It absolutely can be. But generally, it's conflict's not a crisis. It's not the end of the world. Right? It's something that you do every day. When we talk about negotiation, um, if you've been reading the, the Get Into Yes book, right, um, it starts out with you're a negotiator, whether you like it or not. To live life, you have to be a negotiator. To live life, you have to be and embrace conflict. Right? It's normal, it's healthy. And it's part of your job is to turn conflict into a positive force, right? Um, you know, even thinking from like a lawyer's perspective, um, lawyers can turn conflict into something very good or they can turn it into something very bad, right? Um, depending on the situation and what our clients want to do. So I'll say this one, we'll, we'll talk about family. Um, in a second, um, that's probably where you can do the most good and the most damage. If you want to ruin somebody's life, become a family lawyer. Like, you'll ruin your own life. Uh, family law attorneys usually last five years, maybe less. Um, they stay on a little bit longer than criminal defense or, or, or um, public defenders, but they don't last very long because they, it takes a toll on you, especially if you have a family or you want a family. You see this day after day after day, the ugliness of people. And that's where conflict comes into play, right? Conflict is this notion of, of ugly. It doesn't have to be ugly. It can be a positive force, right? We can be adults, say, hey, we have a disagreement or we have competing interests but let's work together and find something that meets both our interests that we both are happy with. Let's be creative, right? And that's one thing you're gonna see as a theme throughout this course is creativity. The more creative you are, especially in negotiation, the more likely you're going to bypass any impasse, the more likely you're going to come out with a result that you like, as well as a result the other party likes, you preserve business interests, you preserve internet or in, in, internal interests, right? In your company, in your relationship, in yourself. Um, so this course kind of te teaches you not only how you deal with conflict in a business capacity, but we also have family issues that come up in this thing. Um, and conflict, you know, can be small or big. It can be everywhere from, I don't want to have, I, I, I want Chinese tonight. Right, and significant other says, I really want Mexican tonight. Okay, you might not realize it because it's so passive, that's conflict. And what you do to resolve it is your choice. You can be very negative and take a bad path. Often we settle 
Um, often we, we, we compromise our own position. And what we're gonna learn is you don't have to. You don't have to compromise. Right? There's, if you negotiate properly, if you're a proper mediator, property arbitrator, you don't have to make a compromise. Right? You can still win. And even the concept of winning has this weird connotation to it, right? Like there's a winner and a loser. No, if you have this conflict, we can turn it into a positive force, and usually through creativity. All right, so if we approach a conflict with the notion of we're trying to come up with this really creative solution that we'll both like, we're working together, that's a much different mindset and different attitude than everything that they gain is a loss for me, right? I don't want them to get what they want. I want to get what I want. That's it. You can see one is very positive. One is very healthy. The other is very negative, right? And obviously very unhealthy, not only to the parties involved, right? Having to be so negative towards each other, it probably means that business relationship won't continue or maybe it could cause a breakup in your relationship. I've seen couples break up over lots of things um, when I interned at a family law firm. Like I saw them break up over lots and lots of things. Um, so yeah, it doesn't matter if it's personal or if it's business, you can shape how you deal with the conflict, right? Um, and we'll talk about how do you do that when you have a party who doesn't want to or who's difficult. And we'll get into a little bit of that today. So that being said, if we think of conflict, conflict takes on many shapes, right? Just some examples, and there are numerous, right? And again, this is just kind of thinking about daily life conflicts. One thing that we, that I like to start out with and address is we have internal conflicts, right? So we can be at odds with ourselves. And we need to recognize that and kind of vocalize that whenever we're like, I have two competing things that I want, right? I can only have one. You're in a conflict because thing A and thing B are conflicting for you. So a good example, like a positive example is when you receive two job offers. Which do you take? I graduated from law school. I did very well, very, very, very well. Um, I top 1% of my class well. So when I graduated, I had six or seven offers to join various law firms in Boston, uh, New York, um, teach at the University of Alabama, a um, couple of other like smaller firms, uh, and a public defender's position. So when I graduated, I had to weigh all of that. Right, um, I looked at. I mean, some the firms that that the big firms would be. They'd pay easily, hundred fifty thousand a year. Um, with the student loan debt, the amount of student loan debt I have, like that would be nice. But, right, that's the big but. I had an internal conflict, because um, at the time. My then wife was in Florida in law school. So I was like, okay, what matters most to me? The money or the relationship, right? That was a conflict, the money or the relationship. So I was always raised that like family above all else, right? So I took the job offer at University of Alabama to be closer to, to, to her, right? Uh, like I drove, it was, was like eight or 12 hours one way. I drove it every weekend um, to see her, right? Like that was just, that was important to me. That's, that's what I needed. Um, so that being said, we had the internal conflict. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go with that, which obviously that didn't turn out well, um, but you know, I gave up the 150,000 to make 35,000 at the University of Alabama. 
Um, and that's an internal conflict, right? Like, what do I do? I have, I have to pay creditors. I have family. I have different obligations. I have different interests. Do I want to litigate? Do I want to teach? You know, what do I want to do? Right? And ultimately, I, I, I settle on family. Um, it helps that if you go to law school and you join a large firm, like a nationwide firm, like Blackwell Sanders is, is, that, is an example, um, they pay you really well. But they know that as soon as you pay off your student loans, you're going to quit. Um, because they're going to work you to the point of near insanity. So if you work for a large firm for your first like four or five years, you'll be putting in between 80 and 90 hours a week, minimum. Which means there's no real time for family, friends, fun, etc. Like you are just there as basically a robot going through stuff that might not interest you because you might not get put in the department you want to be put in. Right? Like my background's criminal. Like there's not that many big firms that have criminal departments. Uh, the ones that do are generally white collar crime, um, regulatory infractions, et cetera. So like you might get something that you're not interested in whatsoever, dedicating your life to it. Meanwhile, you're growing older, right? Time is kind of slipping away. Um, so that's kind of where you have a competing interest, right? And that's part of what my decision was and trying to understand like, how do I want to live my life? What's important to me? You know, when, like, will I ever be wealthy? No. Will I ever own a home? Probably not. But for me, it was family was important. So that's kind of where I was in the internal conflict. Right, so that's just one example. Then we have family conflicts. Um, think about family conflicts over financial matters. That's, that's easily the number one thing that causes um, divorce in this country. Um, it's finances, and then after that, it's affairs. Um, finances, they can destroy families, right? Unless that family turns it into a positive thing. Right, unless that family comes together and say, you know what, we have this financial problem, but we're a team, we're gonna tackle this. That can help save that relationship, right, if we take a positive approach to it. Other things like custody are nightmares. Um, yeah, um, we're fighting over custody, it's, it's gonna be ugly, virtually no matter what. Because that means the parties have gone through a divorce, they've gone through a traditional divorce and they don't take a positive view upon it. They take this, the kind of the normal view of like, oh, I hate this other person. And, you know, I don't want them to have kids. So I don't like who they hang out with, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's ugly every single time. I've never had a custody dispute where the parties walked in smiling, you know, hug or, or whatever. Never. Um, I will say this. If you think people fight over kids, they do. But the number one thing that people fight over when it comes to a divorce, like, and, and who gets what, are the family pets. I'm serious. Like, you will have a divorce that, well, I mean, both parties want the divorce, it's amicable, uh, and they're splitting everything, and then they get down to Rover. Like, they even have the kids figured out. Like, they, whatever, they, they have all that figured out. When they get down to that dog, that's when it gets excruciatingly ugly. Um, suddenly, they're all from, okay, you know, we're, we're adults, we're going through a breakup, we're gonna live our lives, we're gonna find somebody else, it's gonna be okay, to suddenly, I want this dog. And the thing about animals, the way the law treats it, is animals are chattel. Chattel is just a lawyer term for personal property. So dogs are property, cats are property, right? Um, 
that means they're subject to, in most jurisdictions, equitable allocation, right? So you put some kind of value on the animal, and if you have to offset that value for the other party, right? So if you say, well, the animal to them is worth $1,000, well, then the other party has to get something from the divorce that's worth $1,000 to offset it. That being said, it's kind of impossible to put a value on a dog's love, right? Or maybe a cat comfort animal, whatever it is. So there's no such thing as like joint custody of an animal. I mean, the parties can agree to do whatever the hell they want, um, but the courts would never say this is a joint custody, right? That only applies to kids. So it can get ugly in court. Unless somebody says, hey, outside of court, if you guys want to share the dog, share the dog. Like, it, be an adult. Um, I've had that conversation with my clients before. I'm like, just stop being a dick and just say, hey, can we share the dog? Like, that's all you have to do. Um, so again, it can be very ugly or it can be positive, right? Um, I, there are some divorced people I know who are best friends, right? Like they're like, Hey, you know, we didn't do well together, like in an intimate sense, but we know the ins and outs of each other's lives, right? Obviously we, we came to attracted to each other for a reason. Um, so we, yeah, became best friends. Well, I mean, there, there's quite a few. Again, that's when you've taken that conflict and you turn it positive. If that conflict stays negative, you will never, ever like that other person again, right? It, 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 it just, it'll decimate you. So our goal is, is to try to learn how to do things positively, right? So even think something as like the organization, organizational conflict, right? Over the dissolution of a company. So a company is going out of business. Um, and each party wants certain payouts, right? Because the business is going out, so you're selling all the property, um, but there might be intellectual property there, there might be clientele books there, there might be whatever. Um, again, depending on how they approach it, it could end well, maybe they create another organization or it could end ugly. Usually when we're talking Business, business, we, for whatever reason, we get in this mindset that if it's business, it has to be win, lose, right? Instead of let's both win and make this an awesome thing, an opportunity to be awesome, an opportunity to come up with an awesome outcome. So that gets lost. And that certainly gets lost in political conflict. Right? So I'm not just talking like politics, which politics is basically a dumpster fire at this point. Um, we're talking like political conflicts over allocation of resources, right? So um, think of uh, the Palestinians and, and the Israelis. Um, there's political conflict because both of them claim basically the Western Bank. Now, there was a state called Palestine that the United States, with its allies, basically kicked all the Palestinians out of Palestine because of World War II and the atrocities that were committed against the Jewish people and established the state of Israel. Okay? That's part of the reason the United States is so supportive of Israel is because we created it, right? That being said, the Palestinians didn't want to leave. That, that was their, right, there's limited resources. They didn't want to leave. So they have like encampments and, 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 and things like lean-to structures families live in um, and different parts of the kind of like different almost like refugee camps, but they're more permanent, more organized, kind of more of a home type setting. Um, but we see that there are, I mean, 
violence occurs daily there. Rockets are shot at each other, guns are shot at each other, um, because the Palestinians want their land, the Israelis say it's their land, political conflict. Now, there have been attempts to be positive, and they've failed. Right, so the positive approach would be, okay, you want this land, and you want this land. How do we divide it up so that you both get what you want, right, in terms of being recognized as a state, the Palestinians aren't recognized as a state, but how do you get what you want in terms of land and recognition of the state? So there have been attempts to broker deals Right, of like, we'll just slice it this way or we'll cut it this way. And they have all failed because of things that have happened in the past, right? Um, the political conflict has been negative. Anytime somebody shoots a gun, it's probably a negative conflict. So Palestinians and, and Jewish people like really hate each other on, on a cellular level. Um, you think like Iran hates Israel? Talk to a Palestinian. They really hate the idea of Israel. Um, in fact, in, in college, I took as my foreign language Arabic because I'm stupid. Um, it's like one of the hardest things in the world to learn. And my professor was Egyptian. All right, she was a visiting professor. She was from Egypt. Super nice. Like she had us over to her house several times to feed us. And, and if you've never met somebody um, from, from Egypt or e even Muslim families in, in general, um, they will feed you like nobody's business and then they'll force feed you. <laughs> like, so we came over and, and, and you know, we couple of us sat down, we're having a meal and we ate and you know, finish your plate and they come over and said, you haven't eaten enough. And they would just start putting more on your plate. Like you eat, eat, eat. Um, their hospitality is amazing, right? And the Jewish people are very much the same way. Their hospitality is tremendous, right? Eat, eat, like they care about you. They want you to be happy. They love you. And you're thinking, wow, these, these two people, Palestinians are Muslim, by the way, these two people have such a sheer, like shared interest in being nice and loving and caring but they absolutely hate one another, right? So they have a positive force in their life. They have very, very positive people, but because they've dealt with such negativity in the past and negative examples of conflict, it's become this um, unfortunate, probably unsolvable, at some time likely war to resolve boundary disputes, right? Again, you have people who are amazing, but because of the past, they can't be positive towards each other, right? So sometimes you'll have like negative people and you can come and approach it with a positive sense and kind of win them over to your side. These two are so encamped in negativity that positive examples of conflict and positive ways of dealing with conflict just haven't all right, so again, positive is great, but you kind of have to come to it, going into it, knowing that you're gonna have a positive mindset. Um, if you're people, if you're a negotiator, if you're a mediator, arbitrator, they come in with a negative mindset, it's gonna be a lot more work on your end, and we'll get into how that works. So, conflict should be considered a never-ending process. Right. We like to think that when we've agreed on something, if we've compromised or whatever, I'm going to tell you how not to compromise, but if, if, if we have agreed on something, um, the process doesn't end. The conflict is still there to a degree. Right. So conflict theory basically says, look, you have conflicts that you range from you hardly notice them, like you don't even think of them as conflict. Right, um, even internal conflicts. Should I wear the red tie or the blue tie? Now that's technically a conflict. But you don't notice it, like you don't consider it a conflict. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have the all-consuming conflict. 
where all you think about, all you do, all that matters, everything that you breathe for is this conflict. Those are the extremes, right? Most conflict lies somewhere in the middle, right? Maybe it, 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 it and that's from an outsider's perspective, right? If you're, if you're in the middle of a custody dispute, right? If you ask the parties where they think they are in terms of this continuum from like hardly an issue to all consuming, they'll say all consuming, right? Like, and that could be for them all consuming. But if we zoom out from an objective standpoint, we say, okay, we have color of your tie on one end. On the other end, we have the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Deciding if your kid will be dropped off at six or seven on Tuesday is not the Palestinian conflict, right? So we can see it from the outside and that's part of our job. Our job is to see what's going on from the outside because the parties are so into it, right? Like they're, 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 they're at this place where they're usually their worst, right? There might be the worst place they've ever been mentally, emotionally, whatever. It's our job to say, to kind of, not, not necessarily say to the parties because you don't want to minimize what they're going through, but it's our job to take a step back and look at it at the landscape and say, okay, this is, this is peanuts, right? That we're arguing over versus the Palestinian conflict. Um, so that's where most of our caseload and, and what we're going to be doing in this class comes from is going to be in the middle, right? Um, because the middle is the, one of the hardest. If it's all consuming, there's no positivity there. Like it's, it's just, it's gonna end poorly. Um, the color of your tie, nobody cares. Like you probably don't even care. Um, unless you're in politics and then the color of your tie actually really does matter. Um, but that's a whole other story. So that being said, um, it, it, when we try to conceptualize conflict, um, as hard as social scientists, and that's what, you know, criminal justice or criminology falls in the social sciences, psychology falls in the social sciences, sociology falls into the social sciences, et cetera, et cetera. So no matter how hard we try to eliminate or resolve a conflict, we never will. We'll never totally resolve a conflict because it's a natural state that exists between groups and people. All right, so think of it this way. A lawyer argues, there's the conflict, on behalf of her client, and also attempts to persuade another conflict, her client, into accepting a certain position. Those two things can be conflicting. So you have a conflict and a conflict that are conflicting. So no matter what, when you resolve one, the other one doesn't go away. Right? We minimize it, we try to swallow it, we try to say, you know, it's an opportunity cost, it's lost, it is what it is, but it's never totally resolved. Right? We can't resolve two competing interests completely. Um, we can come up with very creative solutions that we're happy with, and maybe like it satisfied everything that we wanted and satisfied everything the other party wanted, but there's still a conflict there. There's still the fact that we disagreed over this. Right? We are now kind of like a little, little skittish around each other. So two conflicts, especially, they're not gonna be resolved, right? You, it, in that case, it's a win-lose. Um, and trust me, and being in that position of telling my client to take a plea bargain because like they're unbelievably guilty uh, and they're getting a really good deal, but then having to go to court and arguing that they're innocent, right? That's conflict. That's internal conflict. That's conflict between individuals. Um, 
that's a rough thing to do, right? So you're arguing that they're innocent, but in, in your office, you're saying, take the plea deal, right? So that, that has that own, own internal conflict. And can you really be creative? Not really in this situation. Like it's one or the other. So we can't totally resolve conflict. It's that natural state that exists between people and groups. It always has and it always will. Our job is to try to find the most positive solution. So when you perceive conflict, obviously you all are different majors. You're gonna perceive conflict based upon your education and your training, right? So a sociologist is gonna look at conflict and see, oh, conflict arises from social situations. Political scientist is gonna say, oh, political conflicts, that's what their, their, their interests are, and they're gonna view them from a historical and political context. A psychologist, on the other hand, will study the same conflict um, from what, and, and try to extract um, from what feelings and emotions brought the parties to the conflict and how they're dealing with a conflict will affect their future emotions and feelings, right? So we're all about feelings. One's all about society, one's all about politics. So that's where we do this check-in at the beginning of class, just to see where you're at, because, and this is the big because, you're all going to approach your negotiations, your arbitrations, your mediations differently, because you're individuals. And you're gonna approach them based on your training and what feels natural to you and what feels right to you. My goal is to convey, here are some of the, like, the best practices that you should implement. And if you go forward with this, you'll implement them because this is part of your training, right? So you get my bias as well as your bias. Um, that being said, it's actually what we're gonna learn in this class it's especially like negotiation, it's gonna be great for your relationships. Uh, and mediation is gonna be great for your relationships uh, moving forward. And usually I'm talking about like intimate partners, but I mean also among friends and family, it's going to very much improve um, how you all interact. So that being said, this kind of harkens back to what we do at the beginning of class and, and if we have time at the end of class, um, perceptions of the conflict and our approaches used to resolve that conflict depend on the party's emotional and psychological baggage. So those parties that you're working with are coming into that room with emotional and psychological baggage. Even if it's a business dispute, the parties, the people coming in to negotiate or to arbitrate or mediate, they have emotional and psychological baggage, right? Like, I have a ton of baggage, like mental baggage. We need to recognize that, right? We need to recognize they're not coming in necessarily as their best selves. Maybe they are, but they have a lot more underneath at their people. And trying to see the human side of a conflict is very, very difficult, unless you're a third party, and even then it's difficult, because you'll start to find a bias towards one side or another, and we'll talk about how you deal with that. We also have to recognize that the parties have different life experiences, all right? So um, when I do Lemon Law arbitrations, Lemon Law basically is like you get sold a car and the car is completely crap. Like it, you know, it just, it just breaks down and constantly, constantly breaks down. If you go to, if you buy a car and you have to go to the dealership to get it fixed three times or it's out of service, like out of your control for 45 days, you have the right to a full refund of your purchase price, right? Um, if there's a dispute, it goes usually to small claims court. Small claims court then diverts it to, and it was here in Elmira, the CDRC, which will be our big competitor, um, the Community Dispute Resolution Center. And then they hire, they basically select one of us that are qualified as an arbitrator, and we he'll hold a hearing, right? And when we hold the hearing, usually we have the person who bought the car. Nobody, nobody usually brings lawyers. And if they do, I tell them to shut up because it's not about them. Um, and I'm the arbitrator, so I can do that. So you usually have, you have one party over here, and then you might have two parties representing the dealership. 
they have different life experiences, right? So one party, the party's claiming this car is crap, might not be able to articulate exactly what's wrong with it. Whereas this other party's like, oh yeah, it's a crack in the manifold and blah, blah. like this part of the party is like, I don't know. I don't know what the hell that means. So we have to keep that in mind. That, like, different parties have different life experiences, different educational backgrounds. Um, you might be dealing with somebody who didn't graduate high school, right? And they're going against lawyers. Now, what do you do in that situation? And we're going to get to it, but the answer is you have to treat them equally. Um, you can't favor or make judgments upon people based upon their life experiences and education background. You will, but again, it's, that's knowing yourself and refraining from doing it. And of course, people will come from various cultural backgrounds. So for a lot of people um, that derive from the West, like especially Southwest Asia, the, our concept of we go to court is very foreign to them because when they have conflict, they resolve it as a community. Um, they resolve it together. There's no me versus you. It's what happened, how can we fix it to move forward, to be a better community? So, you know, you're, you're gonna have people with different cultural backgrounds. Maybe you do have somebody who hails from Southwest Asia and they don't understand why we're being so litigious or why we're being very hard in our negotiation. Um, when we should be getting along, right? So you'll have to manage that as well. So you're gonna have a lot on your plate when you're managing this. So this is a chart that I put together kind of. Um, basically, it, it kind of reiterates this necessary understanding is required for a resolution, right? So we think about the resolution process. Part of the resolution process is to one, understand the conflict, right? What's, what's going on? What do the parties say is going on, right? And then we're gonna get to it, but what is actually going on? Understand the sources of conflict, that these parties have conflicts between themselves, they have conflicts within themselves, they understand where everything's coming from, then we try to understand the underlying interests of the party's positions, right? Um, and then understand the potential for management of those interests for a resolution. So what's the difference between an interest and a position? So position is you walk in and you say, I want the kids on every weekend. That's a position. An interest is the why. Why do you want the kids on every weekend? And that's what your goal, regardless of the form of ADR, is to get to. The why. Because once we understand the why, then we know what the real conflict is about, and then we can manage that real conflict to get to a resolution. Right? So maybe... Well, she uses this as an example. Um, a couple is arguing over custody. Um, one wants to do alternate weeks, and one wants to just do weekends, right? So we try in our best way, we don't just blur out why, but we try our best way to coax out the why. So let's say the, it's a husband and wife, and, and the wife wants alternate weeks. Why? Well, she wants to see the kids as much as possible. But this relationship ended, and she, has to, she had to find a job. She's making minimum wage. She can't take care of the kids all the time. Um, and give them what they need, but you know she wants to see them every day. Okay, so that's their that's that that's that's the source of conflict, right there. We just identified that's the source of conflict. She got a job. She can't spend time with them, but she wants to spend time with them. Um, so her position of I want every other week. That's where it's coming from. 
The, pos the position is every other week. Her interests are, I don't have the time to spend with them because now I'm poor, but I want to see them. Okay, that gives us a starting point, right? That allows us to start to be creative. What if we do Zoom? What if we do Skype at night? You know, you, you get to tell them good night every night. Um, you know, just starting to brainstorm. And again, that's part of your job whenever you're, you're doing this, it can be brainstorming. Then we have to look at the other side. You know, the other side says, I want them on weekends. Every weekend, not during the weeks, I just want them on weekends. Well, why? Well, he's seeing somebody else and she has kids and, and um, they are moving in together. And her custody agreement with her ex is that he has those kids on the weekends. So our client wants these kids on the weekends so it doesn't interfere, right? So they don't, there's no fighting between the kids. There's no, um, you know, mixing of the kids. Like, like they, they, they stay separate and apart um, and the family and they take care of them in such a way, right? So his position is I want the weekends. His why is I don't want there to be jealousy, disagreement, dispute, whatever among the kids, All right? So that's an interest is the why. You have a position, I want X. Our goal is to get to, but why do you want X? Why, All right? So in resolving this conflict, we, as mediators, as negotiators, lesser degree arbitrators, have to take a holistic approach, right? And we have to basically say, all right, are we gonna engage in conflict or are we gonna engage in creativity? Because conflict is basically synonymous with a position, right? If the positions don't align, they're never gonna align, right? It's not like anybody's ever talked somebody into, I just want weekends and, doesn't explain why, doesn't have any human element behind it. It's never happened ever in the history of ever. We have to be holistic and we have to say, no, we're not gonna treat this as a traditional Western conflict. We're gonna be creative. We're gonna come up with a, up with a creative solution, right? So, you know, uh, maybe we can, like I said, do Zoom, do Skype, um, maybe we can introduce the kids to each other in a slow manner, right? Um, if they're the same age and that they might start to kind of become friends and, 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 and there's all kinds of things that we can do that we're solving not only the position, we don't care about the position, right? That's what they want, but really what they want is their interest in that. They don't care about the position, they want their interest in that. So that's where our creativity comes into play and in meeting their interests. So we talk about sources of interpersonal conflict, right? Um, there's several. And we'll go through this fairly quickly because I kind of yammered on for a while. Um, we have differences, right? So if you pay, turn to page 24 in your book, you have a list of all kinds of differences, right? People have differences, cultural, ethnic, racial, um, sexual orientation, um, gender orientation, um, you, you name it, right? Like people are different. No two people are the same at all. So we have to manage that as well, right? Because in our last example, maybe the husband is willing to um, budge a little bit, right? And willing to like, okay, we can start to introduce some. I just you know don't want anyone to feel like we're pay playing favorites or something or that there'd be conflict among the kids. But mom doesn't want that, right? She's like, no, 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 no. Well, they have a difference, right? Maybe different parenting styles, whatever. So the big source of conflict is our differences. Resources is also another conflict. Usually this is gonna be in business. There are limited resources in the world, limited oil, right? Um, when COVID hit, limited toilet paper, um, you name it, right? So what our job is, is to, again, get to get past somebody's position 
get to their interests. If we're, if we're talking a resource dispute, we need to understand what somebody's needs are versus somebody's wants so we can determine what's necessary, right? So again, this is getting to what are your needs? What do you need met? What, you know, the why? Why, why behind this? Because the why and the want are going to be different things, right? Need and a want is going to be a different thing. So a want is going to be a position. A need is going to be an interest. And our job is to get to the interest and resolve it to make sure that people get what they need um, necessary from that dispute. Now, this is listed as third. I think it's probably the most common. It's miscommunication, right? There's three types of miscommunication. You have failure of communication, meaning you fail to communicate completely, right? Like, oh, I can't take the kids this weekend as you're dropping them off. That's miscommunication or failure of communication. Incomplete communication. Yeah, uh, I'll drop the kids off uh, Sunday at your house. Okay. Sunday comes. It's 10 p.m. Hasn't dropped the kids off. So the mother is actually entitled to call the police and say that he broke their agreement and she considers the children to be kidnapped. Well, maybe he was going to bring them over at 11.30 p.m., right? That's incomplete communication. We didn't get, we didn't know what each other wanted exactly. And then there's incorrect communication. Right? Incorrect communication is kind of two forms. One, you fail to specify exactly what you wanted um, or you misspoke. That happens quite a bit. Um, or the other party misheard. Right, so they think that you want X when you actually want Y. Right, so that's, I mean, that, that's, that, that is the most common problem. And you'll see parties who, who, in some of these things, like, it's just miscommunication. We can fix that, right? Like, uh, we can get your interests, we can understand all that, but we can fix miscommunication. Um, and we can set up a plan for the parties to communicate better in the future, right? We can turn this communication into, hey, let's turn this into a partnership, right? Let's communicate constantly. Let's, you know, see what we can do for each other and make each other successful. We also deal with these lovely feelings, anger, mistrust, and fear. So generally speaking, anger, mistrust, fear, they can develop over time or they can be instantaneous. If you're talking business relations, it's gonna be developing over time. If you're talking um, relationships, it's gonna be developing over time as well, right? Uh, you'll be initially mad at something, but then this person kept doing it or this person cheated or, or whatever. So you're gonna have that anger and mistrust. If during our negotiations, arbitrations, mediations, we don't address fear and anger, those two parties are gonna have an unsatisfactory relationship, right? It's gonna be hard to be creative. It's gonna be hard to turn it into a positive, if not impossible. So even if they get what they want, because we have not addressed the anger, and the mistrust, we haven't dissipated it, even if they get 100% of what they want, they're gonna leave your conference room upset, angry, that they didn't get a that exactly what they want when they did. Right? Well, part of what they wanted and part of what we have to realize parties want is they want to express their emotions. They want to feel like they are being heard. Now, fear is a very interesting um, topic because we have to deal with fear just like we have to deal with anger and mistrust. But we have to do it very sensitively, right? We have to, and, and part of our job is to read people, right? So the first thing we have to do is recognize fear. So if we're a mediator and one party is, is just cocky and, and, and like has everything together and the other is kind of like cowering in the corner, we have to recognize, oh, that person is in fear. Then we have to understand it. Why are they in fear? Oh, we're talking about their kids 
they're leaving it up to a third party who they don't know to tell them how they're going to parent and how they're going to raise their kids and if they're going to go to college and all that stuff. We have to understand why they're scared. And then we have to, in a non-biased way, help resolve it. Right? Um, it's interesting. What we actually end up doing is this is, you know, a, a conflict. So we have to confront the other party. The parties have to confront each other. But we have to learn how to get the parties to support each other, right? So we can disagree, but we can support each other. Support is basically your, this was a quote, support is to accept as valid how the other perceives reality, even though I do not share that view. All right, so they might perceive reality as one thing, I perceive reality as something else. So again, going back to the um, Palestinian-Israeli conflicts, the Palestinians see the world, you know, through, through um, Islamic eyes and, and a view set. Uh, Israelis see it through a Jewish eyes and a Jewish um, mindset. Those are opposites, right? But what we can do is say, we can confront each other. We can talk about this issue. And that's what it is. Confront also has a negative connotation, but we're approaching each other. I can completely disagree with you as to the nature of the dispute, as to your religion, whatever it is. But I can also support you and say, you know what? I don't agree with what you believe, but I'm going to support you in, in your belief of that, right? Like, I, I see that it's valid. I understand where you're coming from, right? I, I, I acknowledge it. And that's what we're going to see is a big part of this is acknowledgement. A couple other things that, that, that deal with um, conflict, responsibility. So somebody taking on too much responsibility, somebody taking on too little responsibility, especially in like a business transaction or even a custody dispute. Um, think about responsibility when you're talking about credit for the completion of tasks, right? When professors assign you a group project, you're probably thinking like, I'm the one who does all the work. I should get the credit. Or they didn't do anything. They shouldn't get any credit. And it's especially bad if somebody else gets credit for it in the, in the group and you don't. Right, so responsibility becomes a point of contention, expectation and roles. But the last thing I talk about today, and then we'll wrap up this lecture and move into negotiation on um, Thursday. So just bear with me for a, a minute or two, expectation and roles. Um, your book actually was good in this, this point, and then it said the best way that we can understand expectation and roles as a point of contention is think about a marital context, right? We, if, if, if you're lucky like I am, I mean, my mom passed away when I was 16. Um, so I'm not that lucky, but if you're lucky like I am, you came from a very loving family, a family that stayed together, that supported each other, that you know, was like what you think is the best family. And you try to model that. And you try to do the exact same things that your parents did because you want to stick together and family's important to you. That's not going to happen. Right? Because your parents are different people than you and this other person. This other person might have a whole different life experience. Right? Even if you follow in your footsteps of the person that, that, that most resembles you, you're never going to have the same marriage. Right? So you might see the roles differently. And that's where a lot of breakups come from, is maybe I saw my parents do it one way, and I think that's the right way, so I'm doing it that way. And so the person should conform to these roles. Or my parents split up because this person didn't conform to this role. So I'm gonna make sure that I do. All right, so that's what we're talking about roles, right? expectation roles. Now, one thing that is hugely, um, or excuse me, of huge importance uh, is, is social expectations. All right, so we think of race, gender, social expectations. They have evolved, 
but we need to understand where somebody is coming from, right? So um, being a woman, a professional woman, can be hell. Because you have to constantly think how you're dressing. Is it re too revealing? Is it um, not revealing enough? Is it what you would consider completely business? Like, do you have to wear a, a pantsuit as opposed to a skirt or a dress, right? Um, is the, is you, are you working at like a firm with all guys? Are you working at a firm that's mixed? Are you working from a firm that comes with diversity? Um, unfortunately, we generally still see women as secondary. And we see other races, again, unfortunately, as secondary. So we have expectations that if we see a woman in a, an office, she's the secretary, not the CEO. See a black man in the office, he's low level. Maybe he's even, we think of him as like maintenance or something like that. We might not think of him as CEO, right? So we have our own bias and it is improving slowly. And as we see kind of actually in, in, in especially in Portland, radically changing, right? We're saying enough is enough. So we have to understand that in a dispute, it's a, maybe it's a business dispute, and one of the parties is a female. We have to understand that the corporate expectations of a female are to be obedient, right? They're just there until they get a husband, or they're there until um, you know, they get married and can just go home and, and be a housewife and that they shouldn't be involved in leadership or leadership decisions, that they should you know, just stay out of it, they should be helpers, they should be secretaries, whatever. That's unfortunately the prevailing social expectations that, that person's dealing with. All right, so if you go into a business negotiation and you have a woman and a man, that woman, or maybe, she, maybe she's a very strong woman, but she's still gonna have all of that pressure on her that the man is not gonna have, right? And so it's our job to understand where somebody's coming from. We can't favor the other person. We can't favor the woman because of what's happened in her past, just like we can't favor the other party because of what's happened in their past. We have to remain neutral, but we have to be able to understand and help each other understand where they're coming from, right? And we also have to be realistic in our expectations. So, that means realistic in our expectations of how we treat people in general, but also realistic in our expectations of how in mediation, negotiation, arbitration will end, right? Um, we're not going to, like the startup firm, is not going to solve the um, Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It's not. All right, so we have to be realistic in our expectation. Um, we have to make sure the parties are realistic in their expectations. Oh, I want the kids 364 days of the year. You can have them one day of the year. Okay, are we being realistic? Right, and that's a very valid question to ask. So what we'll do is we'll end here. Um, next class, we'll jump in. We'll talk about how you deal with difficult people. Right, we'll hopefully next class have time for an ending talking circle because I like your feedback. And then we'll begin negotiation. Um, next. Uh, next class, I'll assign people parts um, for the first role play, and then the next class, the second role play, et cetera, et cetera, so that you have a, you know, a solid week or, or class at least, um, you know, a couple days to get into the part, to maybe do some research, you know, bring different stuff in, whatever you need to do. So that being said, thank you for allowing me to go over. I hope you have a great day. Um, you know, uh, try to... If you have a conflict coming up today, try to find a way to be creative, try to find a way to make it a positive thing, a positive outcome with a positive attitude. All right, so again, thank you for listening and I will see you all on Thursday.